Okay, we're not going to have Dr. Frances Bernard, who we all know her as Frani, and she specializes in Aztec economy, society, and culture. She received her PhD in anthropology from the University of Texas at Austin in 1975 and is currently Professor Emerita in anthropology at California State University, San Bernardino. She has done archival and museum research in Mexico, Europe, and the United States, and ethnographic research in Costa Veracruz and the Sierra Norte de Puebla, Mexico. She has authored or co-authored more than a dozen books and over a hundred articles. Dr. Bazan has appeared in documentary programs on the History and Discovery Channel. She continues her research on ancient Mesoamerica mosaics and colonial period Nahuatlis frames. Please welcome Dr. Francis Bernard. Thank you. Thank you. And I would like to extend my thanks and congratulations to Manuel and all of his wonderful contributions uh, for uh, once again uh, putting on a, a wonderful symposium. Uh, it's, it's always a pleasure to come here. Th thank you, Manuel. Uh, in the course of trying to figure out what to talk about uh, for today's lecture, uh, I got thinking about all of Patty's extraordinary contributions, and which led me automatically to an extraordinary topic. So that's what we get extraordinary today. Uh, the uh, uh, we're most often as anthropologists, anyway. I don't know how many of you are that, but if you are, you understand this. Uh, we, uh, we look for patterns, we look for regularities, we look for things that happen over and over again. We look for, uh, for something that we could call culture in a general sense. Uh, but uh, and in, in the course of doing that, we forget that uh, there are always extraordinary things that happen. And I uh, would ask any of you to, to think of uh, any time in your life when you've not had an extraordinary thing happen to you. They happen all the time. Uh, and, but we usually dismiss them as anomalies, as something that's odd or different, and, and then we sort of forget about them. But I personally have come to think that if we look at those extraordinary things that happen, that they reveal a lot of the inner workings of a culture. If a culture is under stress, or a lot of different things happen to a culture that don't usually happen, that the, the culture responds in a way that we can learn a lot about it. So what I've done for today, is to pick out a few of these extraordinary things uh, and see what we can pull out from them, see what we can learn about them. So to do this, we're going to have to take a kind of a little time machine here. And uh, we're going to send you to Tenochtitlan. This is where you live. You live in one of the greatest cities of the world, perhaps 200,000 people living there uh, in the early part of the 16th century. Uh, and you, um, uh, you are uh, one of any number of people uh, engaged in perhaps farming, weaving, uh, fishing, marketing, cooking. These are everyday things over and over again. This is what you do. Raise children, uh, you make stuff, all kinds of whatever stuff there is to make, and there's a lot of it. Um, uh, you can uh, uh, be judged if you go wrong. Uh, being judged, uh, partying, of course, is always a part of the picture. Uh, you play, uh, sometimes you gamble, sometimes you gamble yourself away. First you gamble your spouse and your kids away first. That's always, <laughs> that there is an order to this, there's a priority. Uh, but these are things that are going on all the time, right? Nothing unusual, nothing strange. Uh, in fact, wars are going on all the time, so you always have to be prepared for that. The one thing is that they, uh, except for one little instance we'll look at in just a little bit, the wars do not touch your doorstep. They, uh, they're elsewhere. But you may be sent off, right? Or, uh, or uh, if you're a woman, your husband may be sent off, and you have to prepare for uh, a certain inevitabilities that may happen in, um, in, uh, in, in that case, if, if they come back. Um, and there are these theatrical ceremonies that you or I might consider to be extraordinary, in fact, extremely extraordinary if you have uh, human sacrifices, but which happen with such scripted and uh, predictable regularity that they're really nothing 
outstanding, nothing new, it just happened. Oh, it's the month of Old Fun Easley, we do this. Uh, so if you're living there at the time, this is your, this is your life, right? This is your everyday life. But some things did happen that interrupted these regularities, that interrupted this everyday uh, way of life. Uh, nature, nature uh, was very alive. Uh, there, were, uh, there were earthquakes, there were volcanic eruptions, there were pestilences, there were floods, famine. Uh, and actually those things happen fairly often, but the thing is, is they're unpredictable and you certainly don't want them to come like you would love to have them on the uh, of when easily come along. So, uh, so, so nature did uh, put, put a little kink in, in your life. Uh, sometimes certain ceremonies uh, occurred, such as what we just uh, heard about, the, uh, uh, the 52 year um, uh, uh, world renewal ceremonies. Uh, you, you may have been through uh, one of those, if you're, if you're lucky. Uh, but again, that, that's pretty uh, uh, unusual. Uh, and then, of course, those pesky Spaniards kind of ruined the whole thing at the end, didn't they? Uh, but we'll come back to that. Uh, so this is sort of your ordinary life if you are living it. Pretend you're there. Uh, and um, there were things that did happen that were quite different. And I picked out three of these to just briefly give you an idea of uh, what, we, what it might be like to have something different in your life happen if you're uh, a resident of Tender Ski Long. And I've sort of graded these. They're not all equally extraordinary, uh, in my mind at least. So uh, the first one I start with is sort of borderline extraordinary. It's not extraordinary for everybody, but it is for at, uh, at least a few of the participants. Uh, and this particular event is when a merchant offers a slave for sacrifice. Now we know about these merchants, right? Those uh, haughty, entrepreneurial merchants that took advantage of you at every uh, every pass, right? Um, so there's no secret that they uh, they did risk their lives uh, 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 courageously going into uh, uh, distant lands. Uh, some of them, as you can see, a little more courageous than others, <laughs> some a little more involved than others. Uh, they also went about town uh, very humbly. We're told that they wore uh, very, uh, very simple and um, uh, uh, low-value clothing, as we can see here. Here we have, but nonetheless, you know, they still can't resist ordering people around. You know, they sort of caught that. And they became extremely wealthy. They, they couldn't own land and they didn't own labor, but they did own portable wealth. They did become very wealthy in particularly luxury goods. They, could, uh, they had monopolies in many ways of some of these goods where they transported them from distant tropical regions, brought them back into the uh, basin of Mexico and sold them in the, uh, in the marketplaces. So they're loading up all this wealth, and then they're, they're, they're secreting it. They're coming across the lake after their great journeys uh, um, in, uh, in the dark of night and hiding it in a relative's place and, uh, and not letting anybody know really how much there is. But they are accumulating a lot. Well, what do you do with it, right? You've got all this wealth. So here we are. Here's Conquetzalisli, but this is not the fancy Conquetzalisli. This is the one that happens every year. Um, a merchant, if he accumulates enough wealth, could offer an enormous expensive feast. And that feast involved what we mentioned here, turkeys, dogs, maize, salt, cacao beans, good old cacao beans, Manuel's, uh, copal incense, tobacco. Let me give you an idea of what this was. 800 to 1,200 precious cloaks, not simple ones, but precious ones, 400 decorated loincloths, 80 to 100 turkeys, 20 to 40 dogs, bins of maize, beans, and chia, tomatoes, chilies, squash seeds, 40 to 60 jars of salt, three to four boats of water. Um, they, they collect water in, 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 uh, in the boats, in the boatloads. Uh, each of these boatloads is uh, to be worth 100 cacao beans, so you're still accumulating stuff. 20 sacks of cacao beans, uh, firewood, charcoal, baskets, cups, uh, I'm just going to 
hallucinogenic mushrooms. <laughs> Those are really expensive this time of year, too. So. <laughs> We do try to look into everything here. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, uh, and, uh, all of these things, a tremendous accumulation of, of wealth to be able to do this. So you didn't just do this in one year. This was, it must have taken you several years to accumulate this kind of wealth to be able to then dispose of this. Right? You're, you're, you're basically giving away through feasting uh, and gifts. And even more than that, you had to buy a slave. And you bought a slave, uh, depending on how much wealth you have and how much you're willing to pay, uh, you want one skilled in dancing, and they actually cost more the, uh, the better they could dance. And actually, if I were the slave, I wouldn't dance very well. Maybe I wouldn't be sold. You know? uh, because what's going to happen to you is you're going to be bathed, and that's nice. It's about time, and, you know, <laughs> good thing. But then you're going to be sacrificed. So uh, I suppose everybody has their strategies. <laughs> Uh, in the course of, of all of this, this event, the, um, uh, oops, I'm sorry, whoa, 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 where are we? Oh, I really lost it, huh? There we go. My preliminaries, yeah, I pushed the wrong button. <laughs> the, um, the person giving the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the feast and, the, and offering the slave is this guy here. Uh, he doesn't look very haughty right now, uh, but uh, he has to go through a whole lot of, um, uh, of uh, admonitions by his elders, uh, uh, telling him exactly how important all of this is. And, uh, there's feasting, giving away things, hallucinogenic uh, mushrooms. Uh, and, and then the slave is offered for sacrifice, and uh, the, the merchant does go publicly out into the, uh, into the city, away from his own guild uh, sort of arrangement, and offers that, sac that sacrifice, although the, uh, the priest performs them. So this is, the, this is the thing, this is the event. So what do we know from this? Well, some things we know sort of basically understand anyway. Uh, the, the amount of wealth, extraordinary wealth, undoubtedly accumulated over years. Uh, the gain, although you're part of a group, the gain was individual. An individual was the person who, uh, it was the individual, not the group. Uh, although you could not embarrass your group. Uh, both men and women could, in fact, gain this kind of status, which is a little unusual in our overall aspect setting. The guild had to approve you, but even though the guild approved you, it required public validation. In other words, you gain status within your guild by offering something to the larger society. And that's something we don't usually think about, how that connection happens. We usually think of these groups as being very exclusive and just climbing their own little hierarchies. But uh, they couldn't do it without the, uh, the broader society. There's one, that's sort of borderline. It's extraordinary for the merchants, but, you know, if you're the guy on the street, he'll have another sacrifice, right? So, <laughs> but let's go into something maybe a little more extraordinary, right? Pretty extraordinary, let's say. And there is a story about Montezuma Shokuyotsun, the second Montezuma, uh, has a little problem, and it's with a very stubborn rock. Uh, we need to take this into account. This is an illustration from Duran. And um, uh, keep in mind that the, the wheels, while they would have been helpful, really weren't part of the scene. It would have changed the whole story, I think. <laughs> Here. And I like, you know, you like the freeloader, right? And, you know, he's just adding the weight to it. <laughs> Not nice. So, so what happens here? The, uh, <laughs> well, um, Montezuma wants to glorify his city. Uh, he wants to, to advertise the magnificence of the city. And the way that you do that is build great constructions, great monuments. And he wants a new rock. He wants a carved rock. And uh, it's going to be greater than any, uh, any carved rock ever, uh, ever um, uh, to, to, to be seen. Right? And so he sends people out, and they find the rock big enough, a, a base rock big enough, and they find it in Shalko. Uh, in Shimalpain's country. 
Um, and so they have to if you take a look at the map, you realize they have to transport this rock somehow between Chalco and Tenochtitlan, which is in the middle of the lake. So this is his dilemma. So he amasses great numbers of people. First of all, he orders people from the Chinampa zone, Xochimilco, Mistik, this area here, to go to Chalco and start yanking that rock to get that rock going. So they do. They get it going a little bit. No, the rock stops. They're not going anywhere. They can't do it. So Montezuma begs the ruler of Texcoco. He says, help me out here. And he said, the ruler sends a lot more men. The rock comes a little farther. The rock stops. And at that point, the rock, says, uh, the rock starts talking. He says, uh, hey, dude, <laughs> I ain't going anywhere. In fact, I, I will go maybe a little way. I'll go as far as I want to go, but no farther. And you're not going to make me. You're not going to win this. The Montezuma says, I am the Lord of the land. You're a rock. <laughs> For heaven's sake, right? I'm going to win this. So Montezuma, the rock, doesn't move, of course. And so Montezuma gets more people. He summons the people from the Otomi country. And uh, they come down. They add to the, to the force pulling that rock. The rock goes a little farther and says, you know, you're still not going to win this battle. I'm still only going to go as far as I want to. Montezuma doesn't believe him. So he goes to Azcapo Salco and requested people from there to help him out. So uh, he has all of these various people pulling this rock. Well, ultimately, the rock uh, is pulled uh, up to the lake. They build a bridge. The rock gets on the bridge. And that, that you know, stubborn, that, that kind of little mean kind of rock decides then that it's going to just crash through the bridge into the lake and, uh, and disappear. Divers are sent down, they can't find the rock, uh, and later on the rock is found back in Chalco. <laughs> <laughs> Who won, right? <laughs> so, uh, so, so I mean, it's, it's a wonderful story. I think this is a fabulous story, right? But what do we know, what does it tell us, right? It tell us, tells us actually quite a few things. For one thing, uh, the ruler is willing to make an enormous investment for this uh, for, for a monument, right? That is an extremely important thing to have that symbol for him. And it's not only the guys pulling, the laborers pulling the rock, but there are priests and jesters and musicians, all kinds of folks helping this along. It's recorded that 10 to 12,000 laborers were employed in this. Now, uh, this is from a Spanish account, a Spanish time account. Uh, we know that they're notorious for exaggerating, but say you cut the numbers in half, you've still got five to six thousand people. That's still a lot of people. Mm -hmm. the most, two, two of the most interesting things to me is that Montezuma variously, he ordered, he begged, he summoned, or he requested these people. And it's a real window into how he related to the different people. Uh, he didn't order the king of Texcoco, but he did order the people from the Chinampa zone whom he controlled better. So you have a good idea of how, what his relations were to these other, uh, other groups. And on the more uh, uh, nuanced side of things, uh, fate enters in. The rock represents fate, right? Uh, you're not going to do this if I don't want it to, right? And it really presages all of these omens and whatnot that occur later on. Um, he was doomed to fail. The rock told him he was going to fail. Uh, he tried to resist it, but it was to no avail. So uh, we actually can learn quite a bit about this funky little story about the rock. And there's one that's, uh, my third one is one that I call definitely extraordinary, and re uh, Duran records it, and he calls it a strange situation. It was even odd to him. And this is a case where uh, uh, refugees from Wayshop Cinco to the east of the basin of Mexico are welcomed into Tenochtitlan. Now, on the surface, it doesn't sound like much. Okay, sure, fine, right? But consider this. Huesio Cinco and the Mexica, uh, the Aztecs, uh, had been traditional enemies, in fact, very serious enemies. And right before this particular event that we're talking about in the early 16th century, there had been a, a very desperate battle between the Mexica and the Huesio Cinco's. Two of Montezuma's brothers were killed in that battle, so you can imagine that the emotions ran fairly high between these groups. 
Uh, and, uh, and, and so this was the setting. Now, we know there was warfare going on all the time, but these particular groups were really went at it. Well, uh, at this moment, uh, when the Wayship Cinco's, uh, Wayship Cinco's start getting in trouble, uh, and they come to Montezuma for help because they say that the Plash Columns, who are their neighbors, and are right up in that same area, uh, have been bad neighbors. Very bad. Very bad. In fact, they've been ravaging their fields, destroying their crops for two years, is what the Wayship Cinco's claim. So they have bad neighbors and they want help. So, uh, even after having killed two of Montezuma's brothers, they dare to come to Montezuma and ask for help. Be my friend, right? Help us. We're refugees. Take us in. And Montezuma does. He takes them in. In fact, whoops, let me go back here. Uh, he takes them into the extent that he welcomes all the Wishup Cinco's, and uh, the, report, the report says that most of them came. And uh, they stayed in the, uh, the nobles, stayed in the nobles' houses, commoners housed uh, all manner of weights of cinco commoners, uh, and, and at their own expense. And Montezuma says, be generous, you know, and then the, the weights of cincos didn't have to pay anything, as it were. So, uh, so, so basically Montezuma is being a little overly generous, and he says, okay, while you're here in weights of cinco, we'll take care of things. We'll go over to Flash Tala, it was an excuse for him, of course. We'll go over to Slash Kala, we'll beat them up and get things better for you. Okay, fine. Yeah. And he did. And they captured a great general in the course of that. And things sort of ironed out a little bit. And, and the Waste of Cinco's then were allowed to leave, although not all of them did. A couple of years later, after things had settled back, the Waste of Cinco's come in and raid a temple at the edge of Tenochtitlan. Now, business as usual again, right? So from friend to foe, uh, after having been from foe to friend. Right? Uh, th this, by the way, was this volatile kinds of, of uh, these volatile kinds of military relations were extremely common. They went on all the time. But this was a little extreme since the uh, degree of hospitality that uh, that uh, the Mexica had given the Wayship Cinco's. This, by the way, was the only time prior to the Spaniards that any uh, any enemy. Uh, even approached the city of, of Tenochtitlan in any uh, military way. It was quite a shock to the Mexica. So what about this event? What does it tell us? This is a, it ends up being kind of interesting to me. Uh, these uh, volatile relations that we know about, uh, in a, just in a moment, in a flash, it doesn't take anything to become friends to enemies, enemies to friends. Uh, you really have to have short memories. You know, Montezuma forgot about his brothers awful fast and all of that, right? Um, so, so, so we know these go up and down and up and down, and, and uh, this was, of course, something that Cortez took advantage of ultimately. Uh, Montezuma, he was willing to uh, kind of divide and conquer, right? Kind of, uh, something that, that Cortez did later on. So it wasn't just Cortez's idea, right? Uh, Montezuma was happy to... Uh, uh, to separate the Wayship Cinco's and the Flash Kalas because they had often been allied against him. But many Wayship Cinco people, according to the story, actually stayed in Tenochtitlan after the uh, after they were allowed to go back home. I'm sort of like you know, you kind of like the bright city lights after all that. Uh, so uh, you kind of wonder about this. We talk about cities being diverse and mobility of people, but this is an interesting uh, kind of twist on. The, uh, the kind of, of um, way that people might move into other people's cities. And uh, it is a, it's just more of a question than an answer, right? And how, uh, how diverse were these cities and how did they become diverse? This is one possible way through these kinds of uh, peculiar situations. Uh, and it gives us a, sort of a window into mobility. Uh, we think of mobility, people moving for economic reasons or, uh, or um, uh, a reason such as that, but here's another reason uh, that, uh, that approached right before us. And then, massively extraordinary, here come the Spaniards. But that's another story. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> No.
Now this one I feel fully capable of speaking to. Where did I first meet her? She had <clears throat> she finished everything but her dissertation in Texas, and then her husband was got a job in Southern California, so he was working full time, and she was writing her dissertation. So she decided she would stop by UCLA and she would take one of Nicholson's um, seminars, and that's where I met Franny. Yes, and got to know her. In fact, I've been out of school for all those years. I know her 11, 12 years, and I think Franny taught me Mesoamerican archaeology for those 12 years. Do you remember that? Yeah. Anyway, and then she told me that she had decided to do a wonderful thing. She decided she would bring out a new edition of Codex Mendoza. And I said, I think that's fabulous, and I hope you'll let me write something about clothing. Fine, she said. And then a week or two later, she came back and said, would you like to help me with the Codex Mendoza? And I said, yes. If you'll come in the back country of Mexico with me in the field, to figure out what the Spanish, if the Spanish are still wearing some of them, what they were wearing when I studied them in the codices, and she agreed. I had five field seasons in the back country of Mexico, all of them funded by National Geographic. I think Franny was with me on the first three. Um, I said to her today, do you remember the time we got stuck in the Rio Pantepec? <laughs> And she said yes, and she was really the hero of it. It was a big river. I mean, it wasn't to be taken lightly. It was as big as where I am back to the back wall. Anyway, oh, bigger, <laughs> but much bigger. Anyway, I got midway through and got stuck. There was a hole there that I got stuck in that hole. And I was sitting there thinking, what do I do now? And Franny was the heroine of the thing. She said, first you go forward, then you go backward, then you go forward, then you go backward, then you go forward, and sure enough, out we came. And we went and did, did you think the name of that town? We went to a town, yet another town with yet another Nawat name. And we worked all day. At the end of the day, we were tired. We got in the car. There were four of us. Franny was there, and her by Honor Johnson, the authority on Indian costume, and Edward Mader, who at that time was the curator of costumes and textiles at LACMA. And of course, I was there, and I was driving. And at the end of the day, I drove from that village, and I came to the edge of that river. And I stopped and I looked at it, and then I remembered that um, National Geographic uses very 19th century language. And I was the head of the ex expedition. And I remember thinking, yeah, and the head of the expedition gets to drive across the Rio Dante bed. But we did, and we came through. So I've known Franny for a long time, and she has been a very organized scholar, and I've learned a lot from her, and that's what I wanted to say.